Branch. Welcome back to our All Branch Christmas podcast. If you're listening to this, I'm Pastor Greg. and glad that you're joining us here for episode number 14. Yes, we are excited about kind of searching out all things Christmas in this season so that we can uh, learn to love, live, and share the Christ of Christmas. We actually want to encourage you guys, as you're learning to love Christ, to enjoy the music of Christmas as much as you get to enjoy the stories of Christmas and all the other accoutrements that go on with Christmas. Yep, big word. But today, we've got a special guest. David Weiss is back with us, and he's going to be walking us through what is one of the most popular Christmas carols that has ever been. And that is this um, one called, What Child Is This? Um, It comes from... um, a history that is pretty, pretty amazing. And David does a great job applying it to us. And also just uh, telling us a little bit about the music behind it. I'm excited about this one. I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, And as you listen, I hope you learn something and you get excited about this song and it just makes you want to sing it again. Um, So here's David and he's going to be walking us through what child is this? Hey, church family, Merry almost Christmas. I want to take to you one of my favorite Christmas songs. It's one that's been with me for a lot of years, and I've got some cool traditions surrounding this one. It's What Child Is This? A beautiful, beautiful song with a rich history. It comes from a couple of different places, just like a lot of Christmas songs. This particular one, it was written in the 1800s by William Chatterton Dix. It started as a poem, though, a poem called The Manger Hymn. He was a very passionate poet, and he wrote a lot uh, it, it, actually, he was very successful as a businessman, too. This, there's an interesting story that happened with him, a story of redemption. This whole song has a bit of a redemptive tone to it in its history. So he was an Englishman who moved to Scotland and became a successful bank manager. And he was well off. He had a growing family, had kids and everything, and it was going good. He was passionate about his art as a poet but he didn't really have a concrete direction with which he was writing. But when he was 29, actually I should say he was 25 when he was the bank manager, so a successful young guy. Uh, But when he was 29, there was this really bad sickness that hit him and it just laid him out. And he was in bed for months at a time, got into a very deep depression. And through that time, the Lord brought him to his knees as the hard situations in our lives usually can. He started reviewing his theology and revitalized his faith in the Lord, and the Lord gained his heart through this. After this time, he started recovering, but as he was sick, he started writing poems that were more faith-based. And then one of these was the manger hymn, which became What Child Is This? Actually, it's it's really funny, you know, as a as a musician, Writing songs is something that you tend to do a lot if you're creatively inclined. A lot of times you'll be working on songs and you just you just can't quite get it right and you just have to work at it and work at it for a period of multiple days or some, sometimes people even work on songs for like a year and they just can't quite get it. And then there are these funny songs that'll come up here and there where you'll just sit down one day and it's just perfect in a matter of minutes. It just gets laid out, everything flows, And it's funny, those songs are almost always better than the ones that take like a year to make. And that was actually the case with the Manger Hymn. He penned it in just a matter of minutes. And it just, it's a beautiful story. If you look at it, it's a different perspective of the birth of Jesus. It's someone coming to him, not understanding who this is and asking questions. And you have just the the way the lyrics unfold, it both highlights the humble nature of the birth of Jesus, but it also highlights the inherent divine nature, how this baby is God himself. This is God in the manger next to the donkey, <laughs> you know, uh, just so it, it's this interesting perspective. It's almost like uh, there, was a, there was a great movie that came out uh, a few years ago where there was a, like it was, it was all about, you know, the time of Jesus, but it was from the perspective of a Roman centurion. It was so interesting. He was charged with investigating Jesus and this claim of some guy rising from the dead and he went around all the graves and was like trying to find them and then there's this moment when he sees Jesus alive and just the sense of like being in that mode where you know you don't believe in him you're not one of the disciples you're out to try to you know arrest this guy that perspective was so so surreal 
And this, this kind of reminds me of that too, where you're in the perspective of one of the other players in the Christmas scene. You're maybe a shepherd that came in or, uh, you know, one of the wise men perhaps. So just a very, very powerful set of lyrics, but it was a poem at first. So it didn't really take off and uh, become this international all through history type of song until a little interesting synthesis happened. In Scotland and England, there is a rich, rich uh, bar tradition where people will go and they'll sing in the pubs and there are all these folk songs that they'll sing and it's, uh, it's kind of in the culture even today. I know when I was over there last year, it just, even on a Thursday night, if you were out in a restaurant, there was someone in the restaurant singing music or there will be people gathering around playing music with their uh, bagpipes or uh, banjos or guitars or flutes. It's really, uh, really quite fun. But, you know, bar tunes are inherently not meant for Jesus. They are meant to be familiar. They're songs that people have sung uh, and maybe in their families for a long time. There was a really, really old song at this time called Green Sleeves. And it traces back to the 1500s, maybe the 1600s, when I think it was officially penned with some lyrics, but there are just a number of different lyrics that went with this song. And there isn't really a direct uh, bit of information that shows when the thing first came out. It might go back to the 1300s or the 1200s, but stylistically it is very, very different than what you would hear in a typical song today. Uh, it's one reason why I think it really has such a powerful effect and the power of the melody mixed with the power of the words just had this wonderful synthesis. And it's interesting the way the melody is crafted. I'm gonna go into a little bit of the music behind this. So the opening phrases all have a certain key. And when it goes to this, this is Christ the King, there's a fascinating shift that happens. It's actually a key shift. And you know, for me, uh, for my Christmas tradition, I was actually playing the song wrong for a long time. It's kind of funny. Uh, for a lot of the years, my tradition was to go around the Christmas tree and, and play this song. And the way that I played it, I played as most songs are played. I played it all in one key and one scale. Uh, I typically play it in D and it would sound kind of like this. So that was all well and good, that was right. But then I would play the next part in F major and I should have been playing it in what's called F Lydian. It's a special mode with a different note and the melody should have gone higher. So here's what I used to play. should have been playing. the song like I did in that first example, I didn't even realize I was playing it wrong. When you hear music from the Renaissance, and I was talking about this a little bit last week, you go into what's called modal music. There's a different uh, scale that you use, and it's not necessarily the major scale. Where all of the different notes are going to be from that scale you have different types of scales and they have a different sound because the notes uh, have a different relationship in a key. So, so for example, like this is a mode, I think I even played this in last week's podcast. And a lot 
lot of older music tended to be based on this instead. I discovered this year that I had been playing the song wrong around the Christmas tree every year. You know, my tradition would be to wake up early in the morning and as the presents were under the tree, I would go and see all the lights, take my guitar out and just play this song. I would play a couple others, but this one has stuck with me. I think this is the first one that I ever really did back in high school. When those two things came together, that old English melody with this fascinating set of lyrics, the synthesis just caused the song to become one of the most popular hymns in, in history. And I think that it's interesting, you know, the timing was right as recording was getting out, the timing was right as the American Civil War was ending. So it's kind of like God caused this thing to come out and emerge in an immensely dark time. And people, a lot of people were hurting. And then here you are just, you know, just as the, the writer was confronted with this immensely dark time and encountered Christ in his suffering, so also the song met people in their suffering and brought them to the manger throne. It brought them to that, that baby who is the son of Mary and at the same time is the son of God. And, you know, I hope this year, it's been a dark year for us too. I really hope that that will be your experience. I hope that you can meet Jesus in this time. I hope that you can come to him and have faith in him and just spend time with him and have that sense maybe for the first time of who, who is this? This is, is this, I mean, this is the one that made me. This is the one that has walked with me and has known me my whole life, even if I didn't honor or know him. And just like that song was a bar tune and it became redeemed for God's purposes. So also we can be redeemed and brought into God's purposes. He can use us for great and mighty things. So I would just encourage you just to focus on God, maybe make some new traditions this year, uh, work prayer more into what you do around the Christmas tree perhaps, or you know, Christmas morning, wake up and do a devotional, just do something a little bit different. Uh, you know, cause we have a lot of Christmas traditions and me, I certainly had a Christmas tradition of doing the song wrong, but this year for the first time, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna play the song in the right way around the Christmas tree. So I hope you have a blessed Christmas, thankful for all of you and I hope to see you soon.
Well, you just got to love the haunting melody and music in that song. Thanks, David, for sharing your gifts with us and the knowledge and insight that you've been given by God. Hey, I hope that this particular podcast has helped you in a hard time, that maybe the words and the lyrics of this song and the melody might haunt you for a few days as we enter into this Christmas time. And it gets more intense and more clear. And I just what I pray for you today is that the Christ, our King, would lead you forward in victory as we've been learning. Well, as we uh, finish up here, if you've enjoyed these podcasts, I want to encourage you to go ahead and share them out there with other people to uh, go ahead and uh, find the old ones. They're on YouTube. You can find them on our Christmas um, on our Christmas webpage at obcc.church. And if you have questions that you'd love to hear uh, or have answered, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can email us at info at obcc.church, and uh, we will try to get to some of those questions. Hey, thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us. And we pray that your Christmas is merry and bright and awfully enjoyable uh, this year.